Now, Victorian Parliament is debating anti-conversion bill at the moment, which on the face of it sounds wonderful. No one should be pressured to change their sexual preference. But as often the case, the devil is in the detail. Now, can you please, Holly, explain to us uh, what troubles you about this le legislation? So I think the main thing is that they've rolled sexual orientation and gender identity together when there's virtually no evidence of uh, change or suppression practices on the basis of gender identity mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they're introducing four new crimes and setting up a commission to investigate and meet out punishments for, uh, for these crimes. Um, so I just think we should treat sexual orientation and gender identity very differently and this bill is failing to do that. And on the surface, people think anti-conversion, of course, this is a wonderful thing. No one who is homosexual or lesbian should be pressured to be anything else. Yep. But it's more than that and it's that self-identification because in Victoria you can um, say... I'm a female without undergoing any treatment, without any surgery, and that is reflected even on your birth certificate. Yes, exactly. So I think with sexual orientation, um, we have something fairly, uh, fairly fixed and um, kind of measurable, let's say. With gender identity, there's a whole sort of uh, set of cultural ideas behind it and it's kind of massively expanded in the last few years what it means to have a gender identity. And I think this is maybe the thing that lots of the public don't understand, that there's there was being transsexual back in maybe the 1970s and there's been this huge expansion to the sort of to that category of people which now goes under the label of gender identity and that is something very different now you say this is fairly radical sort of uh, theories that have been now entrenched into law, things yep. that are untested, that are fairly out there. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, will that make debate unlawful? Will you be able to actually discuss this uh, freely without fearing that the Equal Opportunity Commission is going to uh, hand down some sort of a finding against you? It's unclear. So there is actually wording in the bill that says um, for things like op-eds, and lectures. I think those are the two things that are named. Mm. Um, so because they don't target individuals directly, in principle, it should be okay to criticise the ideology as ideology. But any time that an individual could say that they were targeted by you to change or suppress their gender identity, then they could bring a case against you. Wow. And the penalties are up to 10 years jail yep. in, in this. So we're talking about some fairly serious penalties. And it changes the Equal Opportunity Act to, to redefine gender identity. Yep. Now, what could be some of the impact of, of that on, on society? Well, I think that's huge because they've defined it in such a vague way that almost anyone can claim to have this protected attribute and then um, claim to have been discriminated against on that basis. And the bill is also changing, by the way, the meaning of sexual orientation. Oh. So that was defined previously or is currently defined as being homosexual, heterosexual or bisexual, and they're changing that to affection, emotion or attraction between genders. And so they're, they're changing two really important protected attributes, which um, gives a lot more latitude to the gender identity community and actually a lot less protection, I think, to the gay community. And that's one of the things people get confused about because the LGBTQIA+, plus, mm -hmm. and it, the plus is because it just keeps adding, and even asexual is now an orientation. Now, if yeah. you're not particularly... Sexual. I mean, is that really something that is an or that, that is a um, I don't know. You can be discriminated against. It, it, is that going to be uh, a category that someone could identify as and then say that they were discriminated again because they were asexual? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly the right question to ask. Right? Why do we have these protections? Mm -hmm. We have them so that people who are discriminated against in public life, denied service, denied being hired for a job, can can have recourse in those mm. situations. So there's no point protecting things that are entirely subjective and inside the head when they're not going to be the basis of being discriminated against. Uh, this is just... I mean, uh, so many people just think this is just crazy stuff that won't happen because it's so out there, yep. surely... 
saner minds will prevail. Yeah. But it, we are seeing it happen, and we've already had a case that's been reported in, we don't know which state, but a state of Australia where a child's been removed from the family home mm -hmm. because at the age of 15, the parents weren't supportive of their self-declared transgender identity and did not want that child to undergo some fairly powerful hormone treatment. Yeah. Now, will this legislation have an impact on that? If you've got a child who's confused and says, I'm born in a male body but I'm a female, if you don't support them and their transition, having procedures and, and treatments at a young age, could, could parents find themselves in breach of these laws? Absolutely, and there's an example in the bill, actually. They've used the example of an adult child failing to support an elderly parent's sexual orientation. But the f feminist community that I'm involved with are really worried that what's really what that's really going to be used for is gender identities mm. and in either direction. So say your, your older dad mm. decides that he's now a woman um, and you don't find that credible or you don't find his reasons credible, yeah. there could be a family violence provision against you for denying his identity. Wow. And similarly in the direction you talked about with parents using excellent judgment to kind of exercise caution or restraint with their teenagers that might identify as trans for any number of reasons that mm. aren't they're actually being trans and suddenly they're subject to family violence provisions. So that's just so frightening because we know, and anyone who <laughs> remembers their teenage years, it's, it's fairly uh, robust period. You know, you go through a lot of changes, you have a lot of funny ideas and then you emerge from that as an adult uh, with a sort of a more fixed identity. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I worry about is these irreversible treatments with lifelong long consequences, uh, kids being left sterile. I mean, mm -hmm. can they really at that age submit to treatments that have got such serious lifelong consequences? No, exactly. And I think this is one of the reasons why sexual orientation and gender identity shouldn't be treated together. Mm -hmm. If you affirm someone's sexual orientation when they're not really gay, there's no harm done. Yeah. Like, at most, they, they experiment with someone of the same sex. If you affirm someone's gender identity when they're not really trans, you might be putting them on a pathway to puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, invasive surgeries, and then you, you have someone aged, you know, in their 20s, 20s or 30s and they've got complete loss of sexual function, um, they might be infertile mm. and they're dealing with lifelong medical implications of having transitioned. So it's, the, the issues are completely different. Absolutely and that's precisely what you just described, what we've seen in the UK with a Tira Bell mm -hmm. uh, who was a young girl, confused, came from a fairly troubled background. She, after just three appointments with the Tavistock Centre, which is a gender identity centre for children, they put her on hormones and then testosterone and double mastectomy. And very shortly after, she realised this was a terrible mistake. She's now 23, mm -hmm. thinks she's sterile, which just would be such a terrible thing to be living with for the rest of your life, has all sorts of other uh, complications. And she took the Tavistock Centre to court and the court found in her favour that these kids under 18 really don't have... Uh, the facility to, to submit to these treatments and knowing what the full consequences are. Yeah. Do we have anything like that in Australia? Because we are actually, uh, even the Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne has a gender clinic and they're treating kids as young as 10 years old. Yeah, no, it's really worrying. We don't. There are people who are speaking out, um, but we don't have anything like the Bell verdict they've just had in the UK. So. In a way, it's a verdict that will set a precedent for Australia. So I think if someone were to bring a challenge, the fact that the court has decided that way will be great for us. Mm -hmm. And there's so much like helpful reasoning in the judgment, right, about really bringing out the percentage of children who identify as trans that are actually autistic, for example, mm. or just any other reasons children might have for identifying this way, which give us reason to be cautious about those identifications. Um, but unfortunately, it seems to me that Australia is going still in the opposite direction, the affirmation only direction. Mm. Um, so something is going to need to happen to slow that down and then turn that around. And it's one thing to go the affirmation direction for an adult mm. who knows who they are and, and can submit to that. But yeah. when you're talking about a 14 or a 15 year old, even a 10 year old getting um, puberty blockers, that's what worries me. Now, uh, that's self affirmation model, what can that mean for female-only spaces? If you've got someone who hasn't undergone any sort of treatment but says, I'm female, mm -hmm. even if they've still got a male body, 
can they gain access to uh, shelters, uh, change rooms, maybe even female prisons if they're sentenced? It, it, what, are, what are the... Uh, what, what happens in the law there? Yeah, I mean, that's you, you ask exactly the right question because one of the sets of worries about children is they're making the wrong choice. And then we often say, well, yeah, but with adults it's completely different. Let them do whatever they like. Yeah. But I think an assumption that often comes along with that is let them do whatever they like, and now if they identify as women, they should be treated as women for 100% of the time in all the cases. And so feminist groups, um, the kind of groups that I'm involved with, they're pushing back on things like, um, for example, you have a, a women-only rape shelter or mm -hmm. domestic violence service. Uh, and we think that interests that those kinds of spaces serve for women will be compromised by being mixed sex on the basis of self-identification. And this just this kind of tension shows up in a range of spaces. So sports is another really good example. Yeah. You have... Well, there's just a disadvantage there is that men are stronger and faster. So if yeah. they start competing in women's sport, they're going to win everything. Exactly, and they are. That's happening in various sports around the world. Yeah. Um, and so we think that's really unfair. That's, well, there is this rift developing in the feminist movement, isn't it? You've got the, people like yourself, Jermaine Greer, J.K. Rowling, mm -hmm. who are saying, wait a second, some of this trans uh, activism is not good for women. Yep. And then you've got, I would say, the bulk of the modern feminist movement who are very much with the trans lobby. So tell us about that and what, what, what... Is there one side that's prevailing or is this just going to be a rift that continues to grow? Uh, I, I have the sense of the proportions that you have, that a lot of the mainstream feminist movement is kind of on board with gender identity ideology and kind of self-identification, mm. self-expression. Um, I'm optimistic about turning it around, so most of my current research and a lot of the researchers that I'm networked in with are trying to find ways to make accessible arguments for you know, slowing that down, defending the importance of sex and sex-based rights to feminism, but I think it's going to be a really big, hard battle because it's gone so far. It has. I think you've got by far the bulk of the community with you, the mainstream opinion, but in that academic, yep. media, political activist space, that's, I think, where where you struggle. And uh, there is so much deplatforming and really vicious attacks against women yep. who say, wait a second, just this is, doesn't make sense or this is not a healthy way to go. Tell us about what you've copped. You've been banned from Twitter. That mm -hmm. just seems insane, given some of the things I see on that platform. Mm -hmm. um, what were you banned for? They don't actually tell you, but um, <laughs> they, had a, they introduced a new policy that included misgendering, dead naming... Um, so dead naming is if, say, you mention Bruce Jenner's name, I just dead named him because yep. it's now Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah, so misgendering. So. Misgendering, <laughs> just, like, it's, it's hard not to do. Exactly. Um, so sex-based pronouns and old names, yeah. um, they count. And I think Twitter interprets this broadly. So, for example, uh, I, I didn't do those things, but I had a discussion, an argument with a trans activist, and I said, you are male yeah. uh, to a trans woman. And they obviously counted that as uh, misgendering, uh, even though it's a biological sex term. And I got a one-week ban for that. Because yeah, that that is this this you know gender and sex. Yeah. But that, that's becoming again They've confused now. They exactly. mesh them together. Yeah. yeah. We can talk about this all day, Dr. Holly Lawford Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you join us again soon. Thanks.